Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you for joining us um, and for this presentation of a, of a basic design of balanced cantilever bridges. Um, as Puya mentioned, uh, I'll discuss uh, two projects that I was a design engineer on, and hopefully um, you get a basic understanding of precast balanced cantilever design. So the presentation will discuss the will discuss some learning objectives, uh, basic balanced cantilever construction, and then I'll go into the two case studies. One is the I4 Leroy Stillman connector in Tampa, and the I95 I295 North interchange in Jacksonville, Florida. And then if um, if anybody writes in a question, I can I'll uh, attempt to answer them. So the learning objectives today would be just a basic overview of balanced cantilever construction, the balanced cantilever construction method. Um, some basic design considerations in determining the segment layout and span layout of the bridge, a, a general structural analysis, general discussion on the structural analysis of a precast segmental balance cantilever bridge, and some detailing issues and protection measures for post-tensioning tendons uh, used in Florida. So for a balanced cantilever construction, balanced cantilever for those who aren't uh, familiar with it is and this is precast pre balance cantilever is is basically the construction method involved per, of progressively erecting segments on alternating sides of the of the pier segment. Um, so you're erecting one segment on one side and then transferring to the other segment to the other side and erecting an, another segment and progressively cantilevering the segments out um, on alternating sides. Successive balanced cantilever units are then joined together using a cast-in-place closure pour or stitch pour to form continuous units. Uh, the end spans, since are, um, don't have a, met a way of, met of balancing on the other side, unless you can do. So. There are some special considerations you can do, but generally those are erected and supported on fault work. So some advantages of balanced cantilever construction include the ability to construct over traffic, uh, short lead time compared to acquiring steel and fabricating steel elements, the use of local labor and materials, whereas the precast segments are usually cast on site or very close by, and local materials and local labor are typically used for the construction or uh, erect segment casting uh, as opposed to shipping in uh, large steel girders or tubs. And balance, ca and balance cantilever construction can be erected using trusses uh, to eliminate ground-based, crane-based uh, erection. So the first project I'll discuss is the I-4 Leroy Stillman Expressway uh, interchange. I'll, do, I'll discuss one of the ramps, ramp C. Um, and go through the balanced cantilever construction sequence and then talk about some unique feature features of this bridge. So the project is located in Tampa. Uh, the, the horizontal road on the top of the picture is Interstate 4 connecting Tampa to Orlando. The expressway along the bottom of the page is the Leroy Selman Expressway. Um, so, the, so the DOT has proposed to connect these two major thoroughfares uh, with the what they call the I-4 Selman Expressway connector. This project was so large that they basically split it up between into two different sections. The north section was designed by Parsons Brinkerhoff and the southern side was the south side of the project was designed by uh, a, a, a couple of other firms. So for this for this project uh, due to the scale and to promote um, to get the most aggressive bidding, uh, four alternates were were let for the project. Uh, bid alternate one consisted of using all steel box girders. Uh, alternate two consisted of an all segmental approach uh, with a mix of balanced cantilever and span by span construction. Bid alternate three included steel girders for the for the flyovers, and um, the red section shown in the picture. It's called the viaduct. Uh, the viaduct would be constructed out of bulb T beams, and the fourth alternative was using was using segmental bridges for the flyovers and bulb T for the for the for the viaduct. So the 
the chosen um, the chosen bid package was a segmental with the Florida bulb tees for the via viaduct. So the bridge I'll be talking about today is that this is the north interchange with the connection to Interstate 4. Um, so there's two flyover, balanced cantilever flyover ramps at this location. Oops. So some of the ramp statistics, uh, this bridge was constructed using precast balanced balance cantilever construction method. The length of the bridge was 940 feet with a width of 45 foot 3 inches to accommodate two, two travel lanes and shoulders, um, six spans and comprised of 102 precast segments. The largest span was 180 feet and, a, and, and the horizontal curvature of the bridge was approximately 600 feet. The bridge was completed in 2012 and the project overall should be completed roughly uh, maybe ne summer of next year. So shown here is a typical section showing that the bridge carries Two lanes of traffic, two lanes of traffic, and the and the shoulders. As you can see, the depth of the girder is uh, nine feet. Um, the top slab is uh, ten inches, and the bottom slab is nine inches. So the pier segments are for this bridge. It's constant depth throughout. Uh, the height of the bridge was not not increased near the piers. Uh, and this was to tie into the to the to an existing project, the Leroy Stelman Expressway, and keep the box proportions um, similar. And the depth of the structure is nine feet deep. The span to depth ratio is twenty for this bridge. Um, the precast pier segments were were comprised of two separate five foot length segments. Uh, this is typically done to reduce the the lifting weight. Um, however, the contractors always have the option of joining the two segments and lifting them onto the pier as they've done here in this project as you can see in the picture. Um, the foundation is comprised of 36 inch drill shafts. Uh, we, we try to use one typical size footing uh, to increase efficiency and limit the number of, of foundation types. Um, however, there was a special foundation at Pier C4, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, so to erect a balance cantilever construction, we typically use temporary towers supported on the footing. These towers uh, can be supported off the footing on their own foundations, um, but typically it's, it's easier to support them on the footing if your footing is designed to accommodate the overturning moments uh, on the on the temporary towers. If not, um, these towers can be spread out further and and supported on temporary footings of their own. So shown here, what I'll show you here is is the basic construction sequence for balance cantilever construction using uh, the MIDAS software. Um, so typically, you will you would you would use a specialty software like Midas or others uh, to simulate the stage construction of the bridge. Um, typical software packages don't you, don't allow you to to actually have separate models or separate structures not joined together in this in the same model. So typically, you need to you need to have some kind of specialty software to allow um, unconnected structures and to take into account the time dependent effects and loading history on the structure. So here we would typically start with the you know erect the substructure, um, the columns and, and then erect the pier segments. Successive uh, precast segments are, are are joined to the pier segment on alternating sides and connected using cantilever what we call cantilever uh, tendons in the top slab. So as you progressively, as you progress outwards, uh, you install new cantilever tendons uh, of, of varying lengths. So during this unbalanced phase, um, what I've shown is, is two segments erected, but typically you would erect one at a time, join them using temporary erection PT bars, and then join the other segment 
and then connect those two segments with the entire structure using a cantilever tendon. So to, to handle the out-of-balance forces during erection, you, the temporary towers will be modeled, uh, as shown here, which can be modeled as a, as a temporary support beam member, or you can be modeled as a, as a spring. So this is what, what it would look like during actual construction. Um, the temporary towers supporting the structure during cantilevering. Um, the cantilever tendon is located in the top slab. And typically a, a work platform is, is installed at the end so that uh, workers can access and stress the tendons during erection. This particular bridge, uh, you can you you can erect the segments uh, numerous ways. Um, the most common way is using ground-based cranes. But however, for this project, uh, a segment loader was used to erect to erect the segments. And the advantages of using an erect a segment loader is if you have very tall piers or you're you're over a terrain where um, locating um, ground-based cranes isn't feasible, then the use of a segment loader is, is very beneficial in the, in the sense that you can deliver the segments uh, to the site near the piers in one location. The segment loader can uh, can drop down, pick it up, and move it out to the cantilever without, uh, w which may not be possible using other construction methods. So shown here is another view um, of the segment loaders. As you can see on the left picture, the segments are brought to the site on a flatbed truck and lifted by the segment loader into position. Um, the picture on the right shows shows the balance cantilever construction over, over roadway. So as here you can, as you can see here where the process will continue where you erect segments on alternating sides. Um, and you continue erecting until you finish the the balance cantilever unit. So here, this is. So here, you can see the finished um, balance cantilever unit for for one pier segment, pier location. Um, all the, right now, the, currently, all the tendons are in the in the top slab. Uh, there's there there will be some erection PT um, PT bars in the top slab and the bottom slab. Um, as segments are erected, uh, you you will have to apply an epoxy. Um, an epoxy coating to join the two segments to for for durability to prevent water from getting in the segments and to and to make the to to join to join the two segments together um, more effectively. So after you finish erecting the first balance counter unit, uh, the end segment um, to the abutment or maybe to another continuous unit is erected. These end spend end span segments are typically erected on false work. So after the end spans are erected, uh, the unit is made continuous by the use of bottom continuity tendons which go through the bottom slab um, and, and provide positive moment capacity and also uh, some states require the use of external drape tendons, not all states do, but external tendons are also um, used. External tendons are, are required in Florida and one of the benefits is that one you get some redundancy to uh, due to the drape nature of the strands of the tendons you get additional shear capacity or it really helps your shear capacity near your supports so here you can uh, let me see so here you can see a picture of of basically two finished cantilever segments and the end span segments being erected on false work the end span segments are typically 
um, supported on this false work of beams or or possibly rails and the use of jacks on each segment used to uh, will be used to level the segments and make sure that they're aligned properly. So after these seg end span segments are joined together, um, a cast in place closure pour will, will be constructed between the end span segments and the cantilever segment to make them continuous before stressing the the bottom continuity tendons and the and the draped the draped uh, external tendons. And typically at the also not shown in the previous diagram was that uh, you would across this closure pour. Um, you would also install top continuity tendons um, to join the segments. Also, so shown here are the is the inside view of the box girder, showing you the external drape tendons and the bottom continuity tendons um, after construction or after stressing the, the bottom continuity tendons are um, coated with a, an elastomeric coating to to prevent any um, contaminants to get into the tendon and into the strands. So shown here is a, it would be an overall uh, construct uh, here would be an overall view of the uh, of the construction of the balance cantilever bridge for uh, for the entire bridge. Uh, starting out with the erection of one cantilever unit joined by the end span. Um, then successive, successive balance cantilever units are erected and joined to the previous one using the at, at the class in place closure pores. So this process is continued until you get to the the end of the bridge and you erect the end span unit of, on that end. So one of the questions is typically why do you need a um, what's the difference between this method and, and uh, traditional method of say erecting a bridge on false work and why sometimes why you need specialty software to design these types of bridges. Uh, some of the reason is as you can see in the top photo, in the top picture, a, a, a typical bridge constructed on false work would give you this type of moment diagram due to the dead load. Um, and this would just basically be a uniform load. It's the equates to a uniform load on a on a on a continuous structure. So the moments in the the, the moment girder diagram will show you that you get large negative moments over the piers and large positive moments in your mid-span. However, when you erect a bridge using the balance cantilever method, um, because the structure is, is each balance cantilever unit is isolated during erection, all of your moments are, are negative moments. So the only positive moments you get due to dead load is when you cast the closure pores. So your moment diagram is, is essentially shifted upwards, so you have very little positive moment, and you'll have much higher negative moments as compared to if this bridge was erected on false work. And in addition to that, uh, as a designer, you need, you would also be very aware that the the moments and the loads transferred to your substructure are also would be opposite of what you would expect if you erected this, a, a bridge on false work. So shown on the left is, is the bridge you erected using the balanced cantilever method. So as you make a cantilever unit, as you can see in the left uh, picture, um, the, the left graphic, the picture on the left shows you the deformed shape, and the picture to the right of that shows you the moment diagram in the, in, in the column. So as you erect one cantilever unit, the, the centroid of the weight of the cantilever unit is towards the inside of the curve. So therefore your column wants to deflect in that direction and you'll have moment. Uh, your transverse moment in the column is, is as shown in the picture on the, in the moment diagram on the right. The graphing on the right shows you the, the deflected shape and moment diagram if, if you were to erect this bridge on false work. So if you erect a continuous unit on false work the centroid of the span is is towards the outside of the curve. 
so your moments in your column would be towards the uh, to, to the outside, and so like using the two different methods, your inside bearing, your outside bearing, maximized for dead load moment are or would be opposite. Um, but as you join these structures and you make them continuous, then and then any loads applied after that would be the same. So continuing this, for this bridge, ramp C, uh, there was a unique situation where we had a, uh, one of the piers had to be designed to accommodate the future high-speed rail corridor. Um, so the available width, the width of this corridor was only, uh, allowed only a four-foot diameter, a, a four-foot width um, opening for the columns. So to accommodate, to accommodate this, uh, this this pier was skewed, and basically we used two two columns, four four feet in width, um, and we ran down the middle of this corridor. So to accommodate the the, the location of the bearings under this uh, for this for this column, we couldn't use a, a typical pier segment. So in order to accommodate this, we we basically split the two precast pier segments and installed a five foot width typical segment in between those two, and then came back and uh, filled this this precast segment with the cast in place concrete, so that essentially the typical segment um, acted as a form for the cast in place concrete. So this so this uh, this pier segment ended up being. 17 and a half feet in length as opposed to the 10 foot length of a typical pier segment. So with the offset skewed bearing arrangement, uh, we had to make sure that this, this pier segment would be, uh, could accommodate the, the loading. Um, and so we, in, we investigated the torsion of the pier segment. And so here you can see the, the shear flow or the, the force vectors in the top slab um, so that we could design our post tensioning and the, the transverse post tensioning in the top slab of this unit. So the next project I'll discuss is the I-95, I-295 project in uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I'll discuss some design considerations, some unique features, features, and also discuss some of the Florida DOT requirements for segmental bridges. Um, regarding post tensioning requirements and also uh, tendon protection measures. So the bridge is located at the interchange, north interchange of I-95 and I-295. This flyover ramp is, uh, is located approximately one and a half miles south of the Jacksonville International Airport. The existing interchange is a, uh, a partial clover leaf. Uh, this this interchange will be upgraded to an all leg uh, interchange in the future. So part of the first phasing of this upgrade will is this ramp SE, which is the bridge we'll be talking about today. Uh, ramp SE carries traffic from I ninety southbound I ninety five to eastbound um, State Road nine A. So shown here is the all-leg interchange in the future. Um, as, as said, this, this interchange would be constructed in, multi, in multiple phases, uh, three phases total, um, and will potentially be let sometime in the near future. So when designing this ramp, uh, the, the future interchange needs to be considered. And so as part of that, um, the vertical profile of this ramp needs to be minimized in order to not affect the future ramps that will fly over this one or to minimize the effect of the future ramps flying over this one. Um, so shown here at ramp SC will be is is the third level ramp in this future in this uh, interchange upgrade. The ramp will fly over I-95, the first level I-95 southbound and the existing ramps and the second level being the I-95, I mean I-295 State Road 9A level, and then ramps these third level, future ramps 
will comprise the fourth level. So two main structure types were identified as, as the leading candidates for this bridge, uh, steel box girders and segmental box girders. The segmental box girders were chosen based on the bridge type study and estimated construction cost. Um, so the length of this bridge is a little over 2,200 feet, has a width of 49 feet 3 inches, is 10 spans, and is comprised of 234 segments. It's typically unique to have a, a, a segmental bridge, a precast segmental bridge, um, cost effective with, uh, with, few seg with this many segments. Uh, typically, precast segmental bridges are most cost efficient when you have numerous um, precast segmental bridges where there is some economy in segment, um, segment casting and segment fabrication, or as part of large projects or long spans where, where it would be more beneficial to have the precast segments. The largest span on this bridge was 274 feet, and the horizontal curve on this bridge was 1,250 feet. So, some of the so typically span arrangement for these uh, any any type of ramp flyover is dictated by what's underneath, and this this bridge is, is no different. Um, column locations are 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 limited, and um, so sometimes it can be difficult to optimize a uh, a segment segment layout while accommodating efficiency and avoiding um, existing roads underneath. So what if if designing a, a precast segmental bridge, um, definitely repetition of span, repetition of segment layout and segment lengths is, is crucial in order to have a cost effective structure. So here you can see the ten span unit and the number of roads that it has to has to uh, cover or has to span. So shown here is 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 the ten span bridge model in Midas. But due to so due to the span length of this of this bridge, two hundred seventy four feet, the segments are variable depth. Um, the segment depth varies from nine and a half feet at mid span um, to twelve feet at at the piers. Uh, this twelve foot this the segment the variable segment depth is is varied over the over the six segments adjacent to the piers. So for the two hundred twenty four foot span, the span to depth ratio is twenty three, and the end the end pier locations uh, piers two and ten. Uh, the, the structure depth was kept constant due to the uh, smaller spans um, at the end spans. So the control expand the depth ratio for these two peer units was 24. So here this bridge was corrected, erected using a ground base crane. Um, they were, the contractor is able to place the crane close enough to the superstructure to accommodate direction of all of the segments. Uh, so the use of uh, overhead gantry or segment loaders was was uh, not necessary for this bridge. So here you can see the one of the precast uh, cantilever segments being erected, and in the bottom picture, uh, the end span unit on false work being erected prior to uh, prior to making them prior to the closure. So the foundations for this bridge were used 30 inch square pre-stressed piles um, and out of the 10 piers only two footing sizes uh, were required and as mentioned before the, the footing sizes and foundation types are, are typically tried or minimized to accommodate uh, uh, to increase efficiency and um, make it easier. The temporary towers were supported on the footings um, so eliminated the need of special footings or separate independent foundations for the for the, for the towers. So the typical segment for this for this structure was nine and a half feet. Temporary PT erection blisters in the top slab uh, were used. 
because the, the temporary PT, um, because the erection of PT bars were external, uh, at the end of construction of one cantilever units, the PT bars could be de-stressed and, and reused on the, on the successive uh, balanced cantilever units. And one of the benefits of using external PT bars is that since they will be taken off and reused, you, um, you don't have to grout them in place. Um, if you locate your PT bars, erection PT bars in the slabs and they remain permanent, um, you would have to grout those. So it's, it's it, when, when possible, it, uh, it can be, um, can provide some type of savings and convenience to the contractor. In the bottom slab, um, external, a mix of external and internal PT bars were used. Uh, the external PT bars were used in the bottom slab near the, near the pier cantilevers due to the varying depth. Oops. So due to the Due to the varying depth, uh, there's 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 a radial component to the PT bars. At uh, as two PT bars connected in the segment create a radial force that could potentially lead to a spall in the bottom slab. So in order to to mitigate this, um, these these PT bars were external. As we got to the con constant depth sections, the PT bars were made internal, where it, it did not um, would not be a, a would not potentially cause spalls. Another reason why you, you, typically bottom slab tendons, bottom slab erection PT bars are internal is that you'll have, if, if they're external, they, they potentially interfere with the um, bottom slab continuity tendons. Um, so in order to, to move them out of the way and not interfere with the deviators, external tendons, and the um, continuity tendon blisters, um, they're typically made internal. So here you can see the transition, how the transition was made between the exter external PT bars and the internal PT bars, and where the overlap, with an overlap so that you get constant, uh, uh, constant compression force in the bottom slab. So here is the, is the 12 foot deep uh, pier segment. These pier segments were also split pier segments. Um, and also erected by the contractor on the ground and lifted into place. Uh, an additional benefit of, of splitting the pier segments is also for transportation um, issues. Um, a narrow width segment and also the, uh, because the, the diaphragms are, are typically solid with an opening for the, uh, opening in the diaphragm for access, the, typic, the segments are, are fairly heavy. Um, so this also reduces the, the transportation weight. So shown here is a deviator segment. Uh, deviator segments are used to to accommodate the external post engine tendons. Um, where necessary, the deviators can also accommodate uh, the bottom slab blister. Um, so with the the full height deviators, uh, what they do is is direct. They align the and erect. Uh, basically, they uh, align the external post tensioning tendons and also future post tensioning future post-tensioning tendons um, in the slab or in, inside the box girder. And they also provide um, horizontal deviation as since this bridge is on a 90 degree curve, um, the deviators basically will enable the, um, keep the post-tensioning enough away from the, for, from the inside web to not create a conflict with the tendon hitting the inside web of the girder. So some Florida DOT minimum tender requirements. Uh, Florida has is has their own unique um, tendon requirements for balanced cantilever or, or segmental bridges. These requirements are not are not uh, used everywhere. Every state is different. Um, but uh, Florida DOT has some additional ones to uh, to enhance the um, redundancy of, of the bridges. So at misband closures, uh, we're required to have 
two bottom slab tendons per web and one top slab continuity tendon per web. Uh, N-span units must have a minimum of three um, three webs, I mean three tendons per web, and uh, they also must have two external webs per tendon, um, two externally draped tendons per web. So this tendency, so this uh, redundancy, um, these measures are, are to promote tendon redundancy, structure redundancy, and provide protection, um, which are vital to long-term durability of the structure. Uh, there have been um, uh, some very well-documented cases of of tendon corrosion in Florida DOT bridges. So these uh, these measures are are there and in place to to ensure durable structures. So an additional Florida DOT requirement is to have um, tendon duct tendon duct couplers. Uh, these these couplers must be continuous through the segment joint the precast segment joint. Um, the old method of, of balance cantilever construction or segment precast segment construction involved the use of uh, maybe like a neoprene seal between the segments. Um, however, this uh, that method a lot of times during the grouting of one tendon you would have some um, some crossover or some grout leakage from from one tendon um, going through a crack and penetrating another adjacent tendon duct and uh, basically clogging up that tendon duct. So what what these tendon duct couplers allow is basically an isolation, a more is more isolation between the two tendons to form a continuous duct uh, to prevent grout crossover to adjacent tendons. And these grout these tendon duct couplers must be able to accommodate uh, straight tendons and and a, and a skewed alignment, a skewed tendon alignment of up to uh, I believe six degrees. So here you can see the uh, so here you can see the tendon duct couplers in place during match casting. Um, as you can see, the segment on the left is a, is a, a precast segment. Um, in, the, in order to assure um, a good matchup, uh, the the forms for the precast segments are are basically held adjacent to the existing to uh, an existing precast segment toward the previous segment and the concrete is cast against that to, to perform a tight seal between the two segments when, when, they, when they will be erected in the future. So here's just a picture of the, of the many segments in the casting yard. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, hopefully it uh, gave everyone a basic understanding of balance cantilever construction and and just a, a very few of the issues that uh, that must be addressed if, as as a designer of a balance cantilever bridge and if um, if there's any questions feel free to uh, let me know or type them into the chat pod and I'll attempt to, to answer them thank you Thank you, Tony, for such an informative presentation. Um, just give me one second to switch the... Okay. Um, one more time, thanks uh, to Tony for such an informative presentation. Uh, I'm sure that the audience liked that and made the notes that was, um, you know, important points of the uh, segmental bridges design and construction that you brought up. Uh, we actually have a follow-up session to introduce Midas Civil, the main software that uh, was used for analysis and design of this bridge. Uh, this session will be on Wednesday, next Wednesday, October 31st at, at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. So in this session, we'll be more discuss about Mida Civil and capability of this software uh, in terms of uh, designing, I mean, modeling, performing analysis, and designing uh, the post tension segmental box girder uh, bridges. So everybody who is keen to learn more about the benefits that Midas users are getting through the Mida Civil, please join us on October 31st at 3 p.m.
as I mentioned, we'll cover an introduction to um, introduction to MIDAS Civil 2013, and we'll explain that why MIDAS Civil is the best software for segmental bridges. Uh, we will send you the invitation soon, uh, so please mark your calendar for next week, October 31st. Uh, it's going to be on Wednesday. And uh, to make it simpler for you to remember, just know that it's on uh, Halloween day. So if you guys want, you can join us with your Halloween costume. I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, session and the presentation. And if you guys have any question, please feel free to send this. And uh, I keep this session open for uh, five, ten minutes. And uh, we'll turn it over to Tony uh, in case to answer your questions. Thank you so much. And you, are, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, evening. Tony, um, if you would like, um, please just answer the questions that we get. We have so many questions, just, um, you know, we can cover as many as we got uh, time. Thank you so much. I put